This is Lance Hightower, one of the Cryptid Brothers, coming to you from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I wanted to give you a different intro to this week's episode here. Under time constraints, I was going to go to uh, the state park and shoot the intro there, but so I thought, well, I'll just do it in my backyard here. Before we get going with this week's episode, we're going to have a brief word from our sculptor in Tennessee. Hey guys, this is Rob Spencer, the official sculptor for the Cryptid Brothers show. I want to do a real quick video just to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts to all the subscribers and the great comments that we're getting about the show, the fans. Um, we wouldn't be able to grow without you guys. You guys mean everything to us, and I hope that we do you guys justice. Um, we got some great news. First of all, the uh, emails, comments we've been getting from a lot of people that they're wanting to know about Series 2, this being Series 1 that you see here in front of me that I'm currently working on, um, will we have a cheaper version? Obviously, sculpting is, is a lot of time, a lot of detail, and uh, we really understand the needs of people who are excited about Series 1 and Series 2. So here's what I'm going to do. Lance and I have talked about it several times, and we've decided to take Series 1, which will be The Creeper, and the tall walker here that's just about finished getting ready to go to the fulfillment company they are going to be limited edition like we said 250 made of each then they're going to be broken they'll be signed and numbered by me certificate of authenticity series two same way but we're doing bigfoots in series two we decided to cut these prices because i want everyone that's interested in these that, that like these but just not real sure if they can afford one we're cutting them down to $49.95 for the Tall Walker, $59.95 for the Creeper. Yes, and he's almost finished. And this is all I'm going to let you see right now. You can see him. The claw that we're doing, this will be a trophy. Obviously, you've already seen that. This is the Dogman Claw. We wanted to let you guys know that we are going to cut the price so that everybody can enjoy these because that's how thankful we are to you guys. Because, again, without you guys, we would have nothing, no show, no ratings, and we want to grow, and we want to grow for you guys. By taking advantage of these one-of-a-kind deals, you're not going to believe the things that are coming. I've got great plans for all you guys. So does Lance. Our wheels are turning. We've been talking about this for eight months. We're just now getting around to it. So I hope you guys enjoy it. If you have any questions, you can always email me at spencerscreatures at gmail.com. Call the Wayne Hunter number. Talk to Lance about ordering one of these. Thanks again for all the guys that have already pre-ordered one. The first few 10 the guys that have already ordered that series numbered, we'll get something special. We'll be contacting you to let you know what. It's a special gift from us since you paid a little more than what we're going to cut these down to. So again, $49.95, $59.95. You can't beat it because once they're gone, 250 of each, they're gone. The mold will be broke on to series two, never to be made again. Plus, we've got some great plans for some things we're going to have at some of the Bigfoot conferences, some other conferences around the United States that we'll be going to, and I'll be bringing these with me along with some other surprises that will only be sold at conferences. Again, thanks again for being a great subscriber. All the awesome comments about the sculptures I'm doing, I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to Lance. You guys keep watching. I just can't even stress what we have coming. It's going to blow your mind. Wait till you see what we have planned for Halloween. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. Rob has been a wonderful to work with. His work is top notch. And uh, to those of you that have ordered, we appreciate you. And we're going to be pushing the boundaries of different sculptures and things that's never been done before because we want to give you what you guys want. So uh, we appreciate the comments. Keep them coming. And as always, we appreciate your subscribership. And in doing so, if you have uh, also any reports you would like to. Uh, call in with. You can call the toll-free number that's aired through the show, but you can also get in touch with us uh, via email at cryptidbrothersinvestigations at gmail.com and you can contact me there. Some of you have already done so. You've sent pictures and uh, I'll be contacting you obviously. Our website is around the corner. I promise there's a lot to it than what I thought, but uh, we're working at the bugs and the keys there. So let's get on with today's episode. This came to me from a gentleman. He was very, very patient with me. He contacted me some time ago. This occurred years and years ago as a young man. He was at a uh, mission church camp in Florida. 
Now that's not where he was from at the time. He was from another location and he was gracious enough. It, it had such an impact on him. He, re, he went back years later, took pictures and retraced every step that happened. The campground has changed considerably from what it was at the time when this incident took place. But uh, his family was there. It occurred early morning and uh, it changed his life. And as you'll hear, it even has an impact years and years later as an adult, as you'll find out. I don't think there's ever been a day that goes by that I haven't thought about that because it's not normal. I mean, when I was in Montana, the fourth day after I moved up to Montana, matter of fact, that same year, uh, when I was 17, um, the fourth day after I moved up there, the guy I was staying with, uh, him and his family, he said, whenever you see my 300 Magnum sitting at the back door, don't go outside because we've had a call that there's a bear in the area. And uh, sure enough, there was a eight foot grizzly bear standing out in our garden, 40 yards away from our, our back door. Good night. So see, that was normal to see that up there, even though it was rare for me. I had just moved up there and four days later, I seen a, a eight foot grizzly bear that weighed up a thousand pounds. But I had never seen anything like that, so I did not know how to describe it. And it, it was like 17 years later, me and my wife were watching a video on uh, or some show on, on cable. And uh, that's when I jumped up to my feet and I said, that's what I've seen in Florida. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it was like a Monster Quest show or something oh, like that. Oh, yes, yes, I remember those, yes. Mm -hmm. And because I remember it was the auburn hair. I'll never forget that auburn hair. And it was six, about six inches long. It looked a lot like Chewbacca off of Star Wars. Well... There's some. It, it's interesting you say that. I have heard, and I don't know if I can't substantiate this or not, but I have heard that uh, the gentleman that created Star Wars, that character, uh, was George Lucas. Yeah. Created Chewbacca out of a personal sighting and experience that he had, and that huh. was taken off. I was doing a little bit of reading. It was taken away from the what he saw. Uh, which would have been a, a Bigfoot. And so... Man? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if if uh, that is a fact, but I read in a personal story of his, a bio, that, that was uh, he had had a sighting, and he took Chewbacca, was a rendition of what he saw years ago when he was younger. So um, I don't well, know... Well, that would explain that then. Yeah, it would. And I when I saw that, I'm like, how come I never heard of this? I... I mean, I was reading, and I thought, what you know, it didn't say where he was at, where he was staying, or what, but the circumstance was. But I thought, I got to dig into this more. If that is, you know, uh, so anyway, I, I just thought that was interesting. You said that, and then what George Lucas taking that character off of. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I went down to Florida with my parents uh, on a. It was going to be a, a one-week vacation, uh, sort of, and, and this was going to probably be the last time that I'd get to see my uncles on this side of the United States because I was getting ready to move up to Montana and work at a ranch. And uh, so I decided to go with them. I was 17, and uh, I went with them. Um, this was a place we used to live at when I was, uh, uh, let's see, 9 to 11 years old. We lived here at this place, Christian Retreat, in uh, just outside Bradenton, Florida, and it was right on the Manatee River. My dad was the head caretaker of this place at the time, and um, we went back there to visit my 
uncles. One lived on the retreat area and uh, the campgrounds, and the other one lived about five miles uh, away uh, from this location. But anyway, we stayed with one uncle a couple of nights, and then we, we stayed here with this uncle of uh, mine for a couple of nights, and then we were going to go back to Charlotte. But it was on this last day, um, this was a Saturday morning in March of 1983, and it was it was cold, and um, I was going to go out to the, the pipe, uh, it's a corrugated, it was like a 36-inch corrugated pipe that hung out over the Manatee River. And uh, it was, uh, I guess it took all the, the drain water from the property. It was a 100-acre property. Hmm. Um, and it would uh, return it to the river, you know, like after rains or whatever. Right. And um, so I used to go over to this corner of the property, the northwest corner of the property, and fish there with my uncle. And... Uh, it was a it was a river of uh, brackish water of where salt water met fresh water, and you really didn't know what you were going to catch. You could catch a saltwater fish or a freshwater fish. So um, anyway, I I wasn't going fishing, but we were just getting ready to leave, and I just I went over there to set on the pipe like I used to and and fish. But of course, I didn't go there to fish this time. I just went there to sit, and um, so I left. <laughs> The, my uncle's apartment. I I got up early and they were still sleeping. And um, I got up I think at six forty five. And I was going to walk around the property, I guess. And uh, before we left, but I wanted to go over to the pipe first, and because uh, uh, I liked that area as a kid. Mm-hmm. So I. Uh, Got ready at 6.45. I started walking uh, over to that area, and it was full of these cedar trees next to the pavilion. It was full of these cedar trees, and it was a, it was very thick uh, forest back then. But there was a trail, and you can see on the pictures of where I walked. That was the trail down to that area. And uh, we're down down to the pipe. I see. And um, that's in the second photo. Okay. So I uh, I walked past there at 7, 7-ish. Seven and um, if you go to the photo, thir uh, third photo, you can see where I walked past, right, really right past this thing. Um, but I didn't know it was there. It was dark at this time, and the sun was just starting to come up. It was starting to get light out. So I went, I took my dad's, uh, my dad used to be a, a deputized with the Manatee County Sheriff's Department while he worked there at Christian Retreat uh, back in the 70s. And uh, I, I, he still had that coat, and uh, I wore it over there that morning because it was like 41 degrees, 42, 3, something like that. Oh, wow, okay. So I wore it over there, and I had cowboy boots on, and... Uh, I sent you a picture of me wearing them red corduroy yeah. jeans. Yes, you did. So I walked over there, sat down about 7-ish, 7.05, something like that. And I stayed there for about 10 to 15 minutes. And, um, of course, I got cold, and uh, it was time for me to get up from there because, uh, you know, out on the water, it, it's cold, or colder, I should say. And um, I was going to head back to the apartment. And when I did, uh, one one thing of mine that I always did when I was a kid, I would throw some of the riprap <laughs> into the river. Sure. You know, that was around the corrugated pipe. So I, I, I bent down, I picked up some of the riprap, and I started throwing it in the river, making big splashes, you know. It was a kid thing of mine back then. And um, I threw about six or seven pieces in in various places. 
and really one of them I threw over there to the right hand side and, and it was close to the bank of where this thing was I didn't know it at the time though but after I threw that last piece over there I started to walk back up the trail um, as you can see in photo five I was uh, following that blue line okay gotcha and um, that Sasquatch or Skunk Ache or whatever they call them down there, Bigfoot, it was over there where that red arrow is. And I started walking up the trail back to, you know, the uh, apartment. And I started, and now the, back then, you can, you, can, you can see in the photo that, that the, the creek bank is all cut there and kind of manicured but back then that these pond fronds just covered this whole riverbank about six foot high okay and i was six foot six foot one when i was 17 and i could dunk the ball playing basketball uh one hand two hand it didn't matter i could run and jump like a deer and it, at six one, they were about as tall as me, and and I started to hear this loud like crashing noise, like, shh, shh, shh. and that's the sound that these uh, pond fronds made when you brush them up against each other. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And they were very noisy, so I stopped in my tracks of where you can see in that photo of five, uh -huh. and that's when that thing walked out in front of me. And now I could already see this thing emerging. And he was he didn't see me. Now it was kinda of dark back in this area and I was this this whole uh area of the woods right here, now it was full of those trees right there. I don't know what kind of trees I think they were some type of a white cedar or something like that. I've looked them up but I can't pinpoint exactly what kind of trees those are. But there was probably a hundred of them in this in this uh little pile of woods right here. But it was covered with the, those needles, those uh, tree needles at oh. the leaf litter. And so I was walking, and, you know, I was walking quietly. But when that thing stepped out in front of me, you know, he was walking through the, the pond fronds, and it was very noisy, and I stopped dead in my tracks, and I looked at it, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I thought it was a a very tall man in some type of a suit or a sleeping bag had draped over him or something like that because it was very tall and very big and um i stopped dead in my tracks and, man, and it, it just kept on walking towards that area and it you know as it got behind you know off the trail of where i was at it got behind other trees and i couldn't see it so i maneuvered myself to to walk around this one tree so I could, you know, keep watching it. And when I did, I stepped on a stick and it made an audible snap. And 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 just like in the that the patty picture that it while it's walking it looks over its right shoulder. Yes. That's exactly what this thing looked like when it was walking that way and it heard that me step on that stick. It turned its head to the right, just like that picture shows. And the second it seen me, Lance, it tore out after me. Oh, my gosh. And, I mean, it's 41 degrees, and I have a choice to make. <laughs> Either run and jump off the end of the pipe and try to swim across the river, or run and jump over the fence. Now, I had on a lot of clothes and... The fence was eight foot high, and I'd never done any. I never tried to jump over or climb over a, a barbed wire fence that high before. But that's what I decided to do at the last second. I mean, that's all I had because that thing was. Uh, I knew it was going to be on me in just a couple of seconds, so. I, I ran and jumped, and you can see in the next picture, well, actually it's... It's uh, um, 
if you go if if you scr- uh, go past uh, the eighth pitcher to number nine, okay, that's where I ran and jumped over the fence, and it caught my dad's coat and my pants and ripped both of them as I as I went over the fence. But when I was at the top of the fence, my head was to the right, and my legs were to the left as I went over. You know, because I laid down on the fence and then rolled over. Gotcha. Yep. Um, I could already see that thing was just like 10 yards. From where I was standing at, that's where that thing was already at when I was at the top of the fence. And as soon as my feet hit the ground, it was already at the fence and it had its hands on the fence. Wow. And I, when I, I reluctantly brought my eyes up to its face and when I seen this thing in the face Lance I thought I, I'm not kidding you I thought I was going to have a heart attack because I had never seen anything like this before in schools or books or on TV and I wasn't prepared <laughs> for this at all it, if it was a man that man could run 40 miles an hour because it ran me down by the time it, it took me to run that 10 yards it had run 40 45 yards wow and, and what um, what time of the day was this again that this 7 15 in the morning to 7 20 somewhere in there because so, i left that's when i left decided to leave the pipe to walk back good night to the apartment so it was around 7 20 ish i don't know it even could have been as late as 7 30 I wasn't keeping, you know, track of time sure. back then. But plenty of light to see detail and what the heck mm-hmm. you were looking at. And and then the next picture, number ten. That's what uh, I was. That's uh, sort of like what it was like for me, because I remember looking through the bob wire at its eyes, and they were they were black. I'll never forget the eyes were black. Now, they could have been a different color. Like I said, uh, it was kind of dark, but I could, you know, the light shining, the the sun wasn't up, you know, over the treetops yet, but it was, it was light enough that I could see that the hair was auburn color. There's no two ways about it. It was auburn. And the hair was uh, six to eight inches long. And uh, it wasn't... Uh, it didn't like blow in the wind or anything, um, but I could see it moved around some as it was moving. So I mean, it wasn't like like a deer fur, you know. It wasn't right. just like set in place. Right. But um, I could see that it had teeth, but I wasn't focusing on them. I wasn't like, oh, here, here's a Bigfoot. I'm going to write down all of its size and dimensions. Right. Right. I. I didn't know what it was, and and I didn't know to take notes that because one day I would, you know, this would be important information. All I knew was I was scared to death, and I was running for my life. And, um, you know, after I seen this thing, I was like, I, I couldn't catch my breath. I was just like... <laughs> I mean, I was scared to death, and I, I, I remember grabbing my heart. I'm not kidding. I, my heart was beating so fast, I thought I was going to have a heart attack and die right on the spot. Oh, I really thought that. And this thing <clears throat> was looking at the top of the fence, and he started putting his hands on the fence. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, he my. put his hands on the fence, and he moved them left to right, and in different places, like the bob wire was pricking his hand. So every time he tried to grab a hold, it would, it was like, I could tell he wasn't comfortable with grabbing the fence. And then all of a sudden he found a place where it wouldn't, uh, it wasn't hurting him, I guess is the way I see it now. And, um, he, he started to pull down on the fence, Lance. And when I could see his eyes over the top of that top bob wire, and I mean he bowed that thing down past the seven-foot mark. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 
and I could see his eyes over the top of it. I took off running to my right, which was uh, heading south towards the upper Manatee River Road. And, um, and you can see that in the next photo of 11. That was the road headed straight south to uh, Upper Manatee River Road. Now, I knew that property, that was the property fence line, so I would just follow that. And the reason I took off running to the right is because to his left, on the other side of the fence, was a bunch of vines and and briars and saplings and trees, and it was it was impossible to walk through. And I mean, he would have had to be a bulldozer to go through that anyway. Now, he did go through some of it because he was running right alongside me when I first took off running. And all of a sudden, I heard just a loud crashing uh, sound like he piled up. And I, d I looked back, and I didn't see him no more. But I kept on running as quietly and as fast as I could. And I got up to where my, if you go to the 11th or 12th photo. 12th, yes. That's where my dad's old workshop was. And the fence right there at that time, I don't know why, but it was only four foot tall. I literally stepped across the fence when I got up to there. And I tippy-toed, and I'm not kidding you that, I tippy-toed. I didn't want to make no noise. <laughs> and I, I tippy-toed from there, if you look through the rest of the photos, yes, all the way back to the apartment from there. And um, and I never seen that thing again. And when I, when I got back to the apartment, somebody had locked the door. Why, I don't know, because I didn't lock it when I left. And I, I tried to turn the knob, and it was locked, and I started beating on the door. And my mom came to the door. She goes, I was looking for you. You were gone. And I said, I went over to the pipe for a little bit. I said, get out of the way. And I pushed her aside, and I shut the door and locked it. And I said, there's a monster over there. <laughs> and my parents said, what? What are you talking about? I said, there is a monster over there, eight foot tall. I said, he's as tall as that fence. And my uncle got up, he grabbed his 12-gauge shotgun, started loading it up, because he knew I wasn't playing. And my my parents, uh, they put on their shoes, and out the door they went. My, my uncle was out the door first, and then my dad and my mom, and I was pulling on my mom, I said, don't go, just stay here. And, she's, and she wanted to go, too. And she walked over there with them. And I was behind her. I had my hands on her shoulders, telling her no. I kept pulling her, and she said, let me go. And she wanted to go over there, too. And we walked right back over there. I couldn't believe I went back over there. but Right, right where it confronted you on that fence? Yeah. Yeah, we walked yeah. reluctantly. I stayed at there at the pavilion. And uh, as they walked on over there, but this thing was nowhere to be found. Now you could see on the floor where there was there was some, uh, you know, like the the needles on the uh, the floor there of the of that little forest was disturbed in that area. Okay. And I would uh, I was assuming that is where that thing ran, but that is the only thing that I we seen we didn't see anything else of this thing. And now, having said that, I've seen on some shows where these things can. I've I've heard this now. Of course, I don't have no proof of this, but I've heard that they can cloak themselves or disappear somehow, and. I don't see how that thing could have got away from there without jumping into the river. And it, it may have. But my uncle and my dad uh, looked all over that place, and they never seen anything. And I kept telling them, I said, can we get out of here, get out of here right now? Can we leave right now? And uh, they only spent like five or ten minutes over there. Because that's all there is in that little 
part of the uh, woods uh, and the northwest part of the property. There's that's just it. It's just them trees and the fence line and the river. And um, after that, we came over there, and I was still out of breath. I was just panting. And um, we decided to go ahead and come on back. But we talked about that all the way back to Charlotte. And uh, I, I, I do believe that there was, this was some type of being or creature that I really feel like now that our government does not want us to know about. And from what I've heard from other stories and uh, the way people that have explained it, that they're, they they block this somehow from us learning about them or, or what their true identity is or where they come from or, or whatever it is. All I know is they're not in zoos, they're not taught to us in schools, <laughs> and then when you report them, people look at you like you're crazy or whatever. Exactly. But I, I, I'm telling you and everyone out there listening that before my God and my Savior, I'm telling you the truth. I stood before this thing eyeball to eyeball, five to six feet away, and that was not a human. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I can't... I'm trying to put myself in that position right now. And, you know, we had this conversation some time back about how you, some people listening would say, how can you clear an eight foot fence with three strands of bob wire? And I'm going to tell you mm -hmm. when you're the age that you were wiry, strong, fast, oh, yeah. agile, flexible. Oh, yeah. And I remember those days, even though they were long ago, and you have adrenaline, a massive dump of adrenaline, I guarantee you, oh, yeah. you're going to be able to claw your way through concrete if you have to. And so that's not, it is amazing, but it's not because at that age, you're at the prime age of agility and aerobic conditioning, as lean as you were at that time. So yeah. it's not impossible to clear that. At, with that much adrenaline going, knowing something that you have no idea what it is, it's just big and hairy, coming yep. at you so fast, and you can probably hear it. So that is not out of the question at all to clear what you did. Um, and I can't imagine standing there looking at that. Now, when you were looking at this, did it have any grimace was it could you tell any any uh what it was saying more or less in how it was looking at you uh it sounds like it wanted to get you I absolutely mean, I, I mean it wanted you and was it did it keep looking at you as it was trying to find a way down this fence or trying to get over or when i first uh looked at this thing in the eyes it started immediately looking at the top of the fence. I mean, it looked at me first, eyeball to eyeball. But then it started, you know, it turned its attention to the top of the fence. And it was it was pulling on. And I remember it trying to put its feet, I'm not kidding you, its left foot, it tried to put its toes into the fence line and through the, the chain link fence. Oh and it couldn't fit its toes through there. Oh, my gosh. Now, it, it probably could. Uh, maybe a smaller toe or two, but not the big toe would absolutely not do that. It wouldn't. It wouldn't go because he tried to do that. Because I looked at him trying to, and then he turned all of his attention to the top of that fence line, and he started pulling down on it, Lance. And that's the honest to God truth. Until and where I could see his eyes over the top of that fence, and I said, "It's time to get out of here." And like I said, I nobody could outrun me. I played on four softball teams at that time. Two of them were professional uh, teams. And I played shortstop and first base on uh, the the two professional teams. But I could run and jump like a deer back then. I could, like I said, I could run and dunk with both hands. And, you know, rims are 10 foot tall. 
when I jumped up at this fence, my chest was already at the top of the fence when I jumped up. So I just literally fell down on the fence and rolled over. And you can see in the picture of the court the I sent of the the jeans. Yes. They were those were the jeans I was wearing and my mother had put a uh a patch on them. And you can see it right next to the right of the the zipper. That's where they were sewed back together. The, the oh, up, yes. up and down. I see it. Yeah. You can, if you you may have to scroll in on the picture to to see. But it was about it tore them jeans about four to six inches. And um, I I wasn't a wealthy person back then, so we had to repair my pants. <laughs> Well, you had and to do so what you I had to do. Continue wearing them. So it was pulling down this fence, and it, was it as it was trying to find a way to get to you? Was did it keep looking at you as it was trying to find a way over this it, fence? It, 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 like I said, when it when I first came up to the fence, it looked at me eyeball to eyeball. Then it turned its attention to the top of the fence, uh, trying to get a. A place to put his hands as well, because it was pretty sharp barbed wire, and because um, my dad got upset, it ripped his uh, sheriff coat that he had, and uh, well, it made it fray from that type of material, and um, to the point that it was just it was kind of ruined, and he he didn't really wear it after that, but he he wasn't too happy with me about that, but. Yeah, the this thing kept uh, trying to find a way to get its hand on this bob wire without hurting itself. That's the way I seen it. I mean, he didn't like tell me that. Matter of fact, the thing didn't make any sound at all until it was running, and as it was running alongside of me, it kind of snorted some as it was running, but uh, it didn't scream or holler or make any sounds. Uh, other than, I mean, I could hear it, the audible footsteps as it was running. And um, I'm I'm here telling you and everybody out there listening, there's no way that I would be here right now if it wasn't for the grace of God to save me that day. Because this thing, I, and I tell, I tell people this, matter of fact, when I first reported this thing, it was... Uh, it was about two year, uh, ten years ago. I reported to the BFRO, and as a matter, of, I, I won't tell any names, but the person who told me, uh, uh, two, two of the people from the BFRO said I was making that story up, that and that they were docile creatures, and they would not attack me. And they were uh, essentially saying that I just wanted, I was saying that to get on the program. And I wasn't doing that at all. I didn't even want to be on the program. And I didn't even want to come forward to tell people that for that reason, because I was, yeah, I was, didn't want to get looked at and made fun of. But one of my friends who does believe in this too, he said, you need to go forward with this and tell people. And, uh, it took me some time. It was some months to think about that, and I finally came for. And then what happened? The second I reported it, they didn't believe me. <laughs> well, <laughs> and uh, said I, I was making it up, and I was not making it up. You know what uh, amazes me is that there is, and I'm not saying this, you know, upsetting to people or anything, but and I don't know past histories of groups or anything, but it seems to me that the very people that say that they believe in Bigfoot are the first to deny and discredit and disapprove of a story that happened to the person that is telling the story, what happened to them, that it was terrifying. And the very people you want to say, oh my gosh, and and yeah. and to, you know listen to you or the first to deny you and i i find that very strange at times um you know we're open-minded but truly we're only open-minded to a certain degree you know when this happened 
you just sta- you stated something just prior to us, you know, telling this. How how much has it affected you? And if you want to share, if you don't mind sharing, if you don't, I understand. Mm-hmm. You know, you you probably think about it often. And uh, mm-hmm. tell me a little bit how how it's affected you, and uh, have you how do you manage it? Well, I I will say after you know I for years I didn't know what it was, and. It was always on my mind when I went near the woods, and 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 when I moved up to Montana, um, there was a lot of animals up there to to that I had fear of too up there. But I never seen this thing ever again in my life. That was the only time I seen that one. But when I was in Montana, everybody, and I'm telling you, everybody carried guns up there. Um, kids. Uh, we went into uh, the town. I lived in uh, a little town called Eureka, northwest uh, part of Montana. And I worked for a pretty big ranch up there. Um, we went into a, the town on a Friday night, and um, the, there was a pizza parlor there. As a matter of fact, I think it's the only pizza parlor in town. But I, I told one of my friends that I was there with I said look at that kid he's got a he's got a handgun on he said Doug everybody's got handguns up here and and then laying up against the wall was a high powered rifle these people literally went everywhere with high powered rifles or shotguns or, and pistols I mean because it was uh, from what I had heard it was nothing to see wild animals walking down the street uh, there in town and and when I was out in the field, and I learned to do the same thing, I I carried a thirty op six with me, and uh, I had a Colt forty five automatic at the time. And well, and that, that that was just the way of life up there. Well, this became part of my who I was, and guns then became a part of my life because. I guess I felt safer with them. I had I had had a forty four Magnum that morning. Yeah, I probably would have used it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll yeah. take my chances with the court system and go to jail, but at least I'll be alive and not tore apart. Exactly. And and then that's the way I look at that now. But uh, well, anyway, I started to. Uh, acquire guns and learn about them and start buying them and uh, all kinds and uh, start i learned how to reload them and i I, over time i've even learned how to make them from scratch um you know in the ar builds and the ak builds stuff like that but just uh it was more for yeah protection and then recreation and of, of course hunting um, stuff like that, but the the guns did become a part of my life, and and which I am a believer in. And I know today's times it's a it's a very touchy subject because there are people that should not have them. I agree with that, and people use them for evil and to to hurt people, and that is just that's horrible that 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 happens, but. You know, when I was in Montana, Lance, I nobody messed with anybody up there. Yeah, I imagine nobody. it was probably one of the safest areas you can imagine. You didn't see a lot it of home was. break-ins, I bet you. It was. Um, everybody carried guns, and there wasn't no trash talking. There wasn't. Uh, I didn't ever hear of any violence at all the whole time that I was up there. Uh, not in that area where I was at. And I know when you get around the the Billings area or maybe Great Falls, yeah, there was, you know, crime there. But where we lived at, uh, that was just relatively a safe zone for 
because everybody carried guns and nobody messed with anybody because I guess they were afraid they would get shot. But um, now, yeah, I have a concealed carry permit because I made a promise to myself that I would never go into the woods again without some type of firepower. And I'm not talking a little 22 or a, a 32 uh, because that will, that wouldn't do it. Not with these things. Um, I just, I can't see I, that I, a little gun like that would, would phase this thing. Now, I, I have seen that these things are different sizes on the, you know, in the Florida area versus out west or even where you're at in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if there's different species. Um, it, it, well, it's possible. You know, I the way I look at it is is just like humans in some regard. I'm not saying they're humans. I'm just right. saying that. You know, not only are they different colors, just like uh, different colors of hair, but we have different colors of hair as humans. There's different sizes of humans, and uh, there's different eye colors of humans. And I, I look at this as a, as a separate being, and that they have differentiation in their um, characteristic, what we call alleles, you know, in the DNA. So mm -hmm. it, their hair color, they've been black red, auburn, silver, gray, and a mixture of in-between, as well as different heights. And I don't know if the region, you know, it makes just, it makes sense that different regional aspects of these beings or creatures that, um, you know, the gene pool, if you have, you may have a taller gene pool and much larger in girth, say in the northwest, uh, versus the southeast. And uh, right. here in Oklahoma, we've had mixtures where, you know, they'll they'll say it was eight foot tall, but we had one occasion where we had a gentleman that he said, and he actually, there was a sign behind it. It was a county road sign, and he actually said, I know exactly where the shoulder was when it walked in front of this sign. So we measured it, and this thing had to be, it was somewhere between 11 and 12 feet in height. And Jeez. you, and it, it was so immense and so huge, when I met him at the cafe, he was drinking coffee, and I could tell when we met, this is the first time I'd talked, we'd talked plenty on the phone, he didn't get up, he just sat there and he was twisting his coffee cup, and he said, yeah, it's good to see you, Lance, uh, and we sat down, and I could tell he was notably bothered, notably bothered, and he just said, uh, and you could just see it in his eyes, and in a soul, and he just said, uh, I could tell it was difficult for him to go out. It's a lot better now, and uh, we've been on the property, all of us. And he just, he showed me. when he, And we measured that sign. That's how we know. We went out there and, and physically measured it, and he said this thing was massive. And, oh, man. And I never heard of one that hot, that tall. So I was shocked as well. And he just says, I don't know how this thing can move that fast. And so, but there's a mixture of different heights. That was the tallest one I had heard. I know my brother Lane, the one that was chasing after the truck they were in, he to this day, and that was years ago, can describe in detail everything. He's never changed his story once after telling it dozens and dozens of times mm -hmm. and there's probably it's less often but at one point in time there was probably not a week that went by that he didn't think about that yeah and i agree and he it doesn't shake him up so much today but it's such a fascination it's a mixture of anxiety fascination the anxiety level is not as high as it once was but the fascination the incredible observance of this thing, not only in its existence, but coming after them. And I asked him, I said, what do you think it was trying to, what would it have done? He goes, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. He goes, I just get a sense that it was curious. I don't know if it was messing around with us, if it was just, I don't know what it was going to do. 
I didn't want to stick around and find out. And so I guess, you know, when this case with yours, what would it have done? I mean, would it, I mean, it's a lot of speculation, but it wanted you. That's obvious. It wanted you. Yeah. Of that, I'm sure. Um, I I was told by the BFRO, no, 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 that was a bluff charge. And it was not a bluff charge. I've seen bluff charges from dogs before. And, and I've seen them on TV, too, with uh, the chimpanzees and gorillas and but this was not, I mean, he never let up from the run for a second, and he meant to get me. And that's, I, nobody will ever tell me different about that because I was there, and I seen the intent. I mean, he, his thing was trying to get over the fence even. Now, yeah, they, I was, it was also told me to, yeah, the thing could have jumped over. Well, if it could have, why didn't it? Well, and that's just it. You know, there's one thing that I've learned with these encounters is that no one's really an expert. There's other people in this genre, this in, this field, that know more than the average Joe out there. But to to for that gentleman in the BFRO or however many there were to say, well, it was that or it was this, you don't know until you're in the head of that creature. And it sounds like, you know, a bluff charge is that it moves and stops. It doesn't keep chasing you and find a way trying to get over the fence to get to you. That's not a bluff charge. It's trying to reason how to attain you. And I just find that very interesting, their um, their instant uh, reasoning, what was happening, and that they discredit your story here because no one... People that's had encounters go to links, and you've obviously spent time at analyzing and why and how come and how come we don't yes. know these to the point where you have these pictures to depict for us of what happened and what occurred and the realness of what occurred and happened and how you've thought about it because that was... Now, how many years ago now, from then to now, has that been? That was in 83. 40 years, yes. 40 plus years. I'm 52 now, and that happened when I was 17. And um, I took my wife down there and my youngest son to show them where it happened at. And uh, even when I went there, I, I, I felt like it was still there. And um, I had, when I was there taking these pictures in, in the, yeah, and they had cleared the woods from there and then made it, you know, like, as you've seen the picture, they put a horseshoe pit there. Um, I was still, I still felt unsafe. I felt like the thing was there. Um, I was, uh, I don't know how to describe it kind of short of breath and goose bumps. <laughs> yeah, sure. It, I just, I, I felt like I was, it had just happened. And that, and that was, I took those pictures about five years ago. The, the ones that I sent you. A matter of fact, I went down there and matter of fact, these are the second set of pictures. Excuse me. Uh, the first one was seven years ago because my son was 14 at the time. And when we had got back from that trip, I, I put them on my, com, uh, my laptop at the time. And immediately when I went online, I was, you know, we had just got back from the trip that day. And I put my pictures on my desktop and I went online to do something. I don't know what it was. But I remember my, I got hacked. And they literally stole everything off of my computer, including my pictures. Really? Yeah. And here, I had just got back. Oh, man, was I mad. I, I drove 750 miles down there and 750 miles back. <laughs> and I lost the pictures that day. And 
uh, I was just, I couldn't believe it. I, hackers just have, that, I, that has happened to me like two or three times where hackers have, you know, out there and you get viruses and or they steal your information or whatever. So that's why I don't keep anything on laptops anymore. Just I use them to go online and that's about it. And I don't keep any information on them anymore that anybody could do anything with. But I, I also I keep pictures in multiple areas. And um, I have a couple of desktops I keep uh, and a, uh, and a laptop, I keep the information on, you know, that I don't want to get hacked. And um, Yeah, well, that's, sm- that's smart advice anyway to have in multiple locations and have photos that are off-site in the cloud, but also in, you know, secure cloud servers, but also um, at home or thumb drives in multiple locations. That's... Uh, Wow, so you went two years later to get... Yeah, the pictures again. Good night. And I, I, that's when I took all them pictures, and I made lots of copies of them. I even put them on CDs, and <laughs> they weren't going to take these pictures. But I, So I, I put them in PowerPoint and some other areas and you know, put the, uh, the words in there, text boxes to uh, describe what each picture. So, I mean, really anybody can look at it and uh, see what's going on. Now, I have a a full catalog of every picture. Now, you, you've only seen just a few. I have a full catalog with over 100 pictures. And, and it's, uh, I guess one could look at it as like it's a picture book, but I wanted to put everything in there that really meant anything and then let the picture and the words uh, describe what it is uh, or or what happened. And I was, it was going to be like an online book I've been working on, but I haven't been able to do anything with it for a long time because we're in the process of moving and uh, to a, a farm we bought out in the country and um, we have a new house new property and everything and it yeah it kind of bothers me there a little bit because this whole area is full of woods and I don't know this area too well I mean we like it and it's mountainy and hilly but I don't know what's in I, it does make me wonder is are one of these things mm-hmm. on the property we're moving to <laughs> well but, um, and that's the thing that um I just got off the phone with a gentleman this morning. He was in Oklahoma. He called me, and he said, uh, and he's in a small, he lives outside of a small town, so it's very rural, and there's grasslands, wheat fields, but you've got pockets of timber. And uh, we had some thunderstorms. This this time of the year, we have thunderstorms, of course, and he, uh, during a rain, uh, these things uh, tend to be a little bit more active, thunderstorms, lightning, and and he just he got out on his porch, and by 11 at light, he was just looking at the weather, listening, and uh, he heard a massive crack. like It sounded like a baseball bat being broke. So, And then 30 seconds after that, he heard like a, like a hollow sound, like uh, something beating on a tree real fast. And he's mm-hmm. like, what in the world? And... Normally he doesn't put things together, but he said now he's starting to put things together, and he he feels that he's had you know going back retrospectively, he thinks now that wait a minute, I've heard these sounds before, and that didn't make it didn't add up, it didn't make sense, and so now you know he's starting to understand that there there's something there. I leave my way all kinds of uh, ways out uh, if I'm going into the woods, and plus I always have firepower because I will not go into the woods uh, for many reasons. Why? Because I know what I might see. Well, of course. I mean, you're, you're, unfortunately, you got educated in seconds. And at an early age, our mind is impressionable, but especially at a young age. And to find out that something like this exists 
when you thought it was just in the movies or folklore that it has such a profound impact when you went back and you you uh, not banged on the door and you told your dad and your uncle and he was they went out what was the reaction on the way back home and from your parents and from your uncle did they seem to believe what you said or or not yeah. so or what what do you what happened there they absolutely believed me absolutely my uh uncle the second he heard me say it, say that he ran over to the corner picked up the shotgun started loading it up with double up buckshot and he had a it was a it was an older shotgun uh, it wasn't like a uh, an automatic it was a it was a it was an older bolt action goose gun oh okay but he, you know, had all, uh, probably a 30-inch barrel, and he put five rounds in it. And he had a he had a pistol, but he grabbed the 12 gauge, and out. I mean, he was out the door and just uh, within a minute, he, he put some finished putting a, a coat on or whatever and some shoes, and he was out the door. And then my dad, my mom, but yes, they uh, absolutely believed me. And we talked about it for years. Now, we didn't know what it was. And I had heard, uh, you know, Sasquatch this and Bigfoot that over the years, but I didn't put the two together, you know? Oh. I, I didn't know what I had seen was a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. And I'd seen uh, the Bigfoot movie this and a Sasquatch movie that. And matter of fact, my brother went to go see uh, one of them Sasquatch movies. I forget when it was, but... Anyway, I couldn't, I didn't put the two together. And um, until I was watching, I was married. And we were, my wife and I, we were watching, I can't remember exactly what the show was, but I think it was a monster quest. And, and it was on TV and they had like two or three shows on that. And I started watching that and uh, I think it was up north somewhere. And they were reenacting it, and that had uh, this particular episode. They had uh, this Sasquatch with auburn hair, and I jumped to my feet and I said, "That's what I seen." And that's when it hit me that these things are called Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And I, I, you know, I just didn't put it together because you know I wasn't, I, I didn't know what they were when I, when I told them to my mom, my dad, my uncle, and I, I never told anybody other than my wife. We didn't report it to the sheriff down there, and uh, it was, I didn't want to tell nobody that, because, it was, oh, you seen a monster? That That's good, real good. <laughs> right, exactly. You'll, so, uh, your kid needs some counseling, yeah. He's he's a troubled kid. Uh, who knows what people, you know, defer to on that. So it's very interesting, your uncle jumping up that fast. did. Yes. It's almost as if he saw this as well, as fast as he jumped up. I mean, just that's just where my thoughts go. I don't know. I n we never talked about it before, Lance. I don't know why. Uh, you know, when we were up in Charlotte, you know, I, um, that particular uncle and I, we were... We were a little close when we were in Florida, but other than that, he was a loner type of person. And we would go fishing together, and we would go shoot the guns together. But other than that, we didn't we didn't hang out like me and my other uncle did. Um, I would go, I'd hang out with my other uncle all the time. And um, I loved both my uncles. Don't get me wrong, but uh, this particular uncle, uh, he was just. Uh, that was that was about it, and I would st I would stay with him once in a while, you know, because we were going to go fishing that night or the next morning. So I would just stay with him, and um, I mean that was that was about it. I mean, other than that, we didn't really 
hang out that much together. It was always either to hunt or to fish or to shoot guns. Well, he he and, sounds like he was a no nonsense, get her done kind of guy. Just let's go get you know, let's find out what's going on because I could tell then if he had not had any you know. People behave that way when they've seen something before and it validates that what they've seen or they know you so well that whatever you say, it's yeah. it's it's the truth. And so that may have been the other part of this equation is that he may have not have seen it before, or, but he believes you that you wouldn't come in and do that. He saw something in your eyes and in your voice that you saw something. Oh, Alliance, I was into hysterics when I came in there. Because when I ran in that room, they were like watching TV, and I said, shut up. <laughs> oh, you, uh, I said, I'm trying to tell you there's a monster over there. Oh, wow. Because they were watching TV and talking about something, and I guess starting to have breakfast or something like that. And um, I, that's when I said, would you shut up and listen to me? I'm trying to tell you there's a monster. And that's when he looked into my eyes, and he said, oh, my God. And he jumped up instantly, and he grabbed a gun. That's when, you know, it wasn't like an armadillo I seen over there or, um, exactly. A exactly. Snake. It, this thing was like, I said, it's as tall as the fence and they got up and moving then. But, uh, when I reported this to the BFRO, they had their lead investigator of Florida in Florida call me up and he, uh, Asked me, he filled out a report about this, and his name. Uh, you want me to tell you? Yeah, you can. I can go ahead. Okay. And... His name was, and he's uh, in the Jacksonville area. Matter of fact, he works. Um, and he's he he was our lead investigator with the BFRO uh, with uh, uh, finding Bigfoot. As a matter of fact. And he he was on their programs. And uh, anyway, he's the one who called me up and interviewed me and asked me about, you know, its size and dimensions. And I, I told him the best that I could. It was between four and 500 pounds because I don't really know what eight feet tall Sasquatchy things look like. <laughs> so I just had to tell him the best I could. And... Um, you know, the color of its size and da 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 da. Well, he said, Well, I would like to talk to your the rest of your family. I said, Here's their number. So I give him my folks' number. And he called them up and he interviewed my mom and my dad. And um, Which he was just trying to cooperate. He probably said, You know, mm -hmm. is, are you a troubled child? Do you just try to get attention? And how was he in the state when you? after it happened, so... Uh, yeah, he just filled out all that report stuff, and, uh, and you know, I was looking for him to post it on their, their website, and he wouldn't do it, and I, I called him back. I said, uh, Mr. Wright, I didn't see it posted. I said, is there a problem? He said, yeah, Mr. Moneymaker said no, that you were just wanting to be on the show, and I said, I am not wanting to be on the show. And he said, yeah, I told him that. And he says, well, he said they're docile, and he said they wouldn't hurt, and they wouldn't attack. <laughs> and, and he, well, anyway, I said, he said, well, you came down here and got the pictures, you said, right? And I, yeah, he said, would you mind sending them to me? And I, I, I said, I have to go back down there now. He says, why? I said, I had them hacked and stole off my computer right before my eyes. My whole screen went black. And he said, okay. Well, he says, well, when you get the pictures, uh, send them to me. So that's when me and my wife packed up the car and we took some time off and went back down there. And I took all the pictures. I came back, processed them, and I emailed them to him. And uh, um, he, he then... Uh, talked to them again. I believe it was him and uh, it wasn't. It wasn't Bobo. I think it was Renee. Mm. And they they said that they they just weren't gonna go with the story. That they didn't they didn't find it to be true. 
and it, it just amazed me. Well, it really did. Yeah. You but know, he told me, he said, he said, let me tell you something. He said, because of this, he says, you really did see this thing, didn't you? And I said, of course I did. Do you think I'd be going through this for nothing? And he says, well, I, I he said, you would have to, to drive 750 miles down here and 750 miles back. And I said, yeah, it means that much to me. Okay. This thing is real. And it did happen to me. And I did stand face to face with this thing. He said, well, why didn't you smell it like everybody else reports? And I said, I said, look, look at the, look at the map. The wind predominantly comes off the Gulf from the West to the East. I was upwind of this thing, not downwind. So it would smell me, but I would not smell it. And there is a, a pretty good breeze down there all the time off the Gulf. So that's why I didn't. That's that's the only reason that I can figure out that I did not smell this thing because everybody else says that they have a very strong odor. Well, um, and and the other fact of this here here's what the way I look at this is a lot different too. Is that I'm sure you know they don't get to. Uh, I'm sure there might be some bathing or something that they do. I don't know that. I'm just speculating, but. You know, there might be glands, too, when they're upset or angered that actually is more pungent uh, during times, whether they're, you know, mad or whether they're mating or who knows. But, you know, it, it amazes me that, again, I say that people in this community, they were quick to judge. And mm-hmm. the key factor is that if you interview people that say this is not like them, there is a change this is not like their personality. They may be jokeful, but they never joked about this. You can tell it. You can just see it in their eyes and in the sound and their tone. They saw something that totally frightened them. It has changed them. No matter what age it is, you need to perk up. I don't care if you're talking a 16, 17-year-old young man or woman, but uh, an older gentleman, too. I mean, and it... Um, you know, it, it sounds to me earlier I asked, you know, how you've dealt with this, and it sounds like you, you've you dealt with this by going back, taking pictures, cataloging. You've dealt with this by feeling secure with firearms, which that's why I, that's, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to uh, fib to you. That's one of the reasons why, too, that I, I do that, but it, that t- it sounds and sharing, of course, that that ultimately helps too. People that's not going to um, instantly say, "Oh, you didn't see that," you know, to share with people that are more or less on your side, and that's kind of how it sounds like you've dealt with it is being able to share to some people that are close to you that know you that say, "Yeah, I know you saw something. I, I can't explain it either, but I know you saw something." Would you would you concur or agree with that? Yeah. I, I I would, but see, for when you're when you're young, you can bounce back from something like this because you know I lived in the city, and I didn't live around this thing. I was 750 miles away from that area because we lived in Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, at the time, and we were just down there for a visit. So when I went back, you know, I didn't. It wasn't like I'm glad I don't have to live down here anymore. I mean, I, I was really wanting to go that morning. And I said, can we go? And we left at 9 o'clock. And I, I never really wanted to go back there until I took my wife. Now, then I was proficient with firearms because I practiced all the time with all kinds of uh, shotgun, rifle, pistol, revolver, you name it. Plus, even to the point of uh gunsmithing and working on them myself so I knew them proficiently so when I went back down there and even though I was loaded I had loaded gun with me I was still scared in this area because I don't ever want to see this thing again I mean I part of me wants to because I want to know what they are but then the other part is if that thing ever got a hold of me, it would rip me limb from limb. I know it. 
So I wanted to follow up with a brief commentary here after I spoke to this gentleman. He later emailed me and said, Lance, there was one feature I needed to, uh, or characteristic I needed to tell you, is that I don't know or understand what its reason was or why it was doing this. But when I had jumped over the fence and I'd cleared it and it came immediately up to that fence and I was terrified and I didn't know what I was looking at, and it was trying to get over the fence. It was it was trying to climb it. When I told you, I was it was trying to stick its toe into an opening of the fence, and it couldn't do it. And then it started to try and go over the top. He told me in an email that it started kind of snapping its lips or clicking its lips. And he said it kind of like a... I don't know whether it was smacking its lips or clicking its lips or making a clicking sound, but it was... It was doing something with its lips, and I wasn't sure. He said it almost had this terrifying, sinister sound to it. That's the only thing that I can make heads or tails of. I So much happened in such a short, short time. I was just trying to process. So he said, I do remember that lip-smacking sound, whether it was the lips or it's clicking, I don't know, but it sure, that's the way I understood it and uh, and of course he didn't hang around at that so I thought that was very interesting a couple of things too that I thought is that um, again this occurred when it was early in the morning very heavily wooded thick palms uh, there was no one else around it was quiet who knows if this thing would have ultimately seen him had he not been throwing rocks at the water's edge uh, now, it didn't see him at all. Maybe that's what disturbed it to walk out. It didn't see him till he stepped on that branch. So maybe, who knows, if it would have just walked by, why it chased him? I do not know. It obviously wasn't a bluff charge from what the BFRO talked about. I find that very uh, quick to judge on that part that uh, from at that time that uh, uh, the BFRO's standpoint was that they just uh, do bluff charges, you know, and they they were looking very tunnel vision uh, down one road of thought rather than being open-minded that these uh, beings have other modes of operandi of what they may do. So I found that very interesting, and since it was a kid, at that time he was 17, they didn't give it any, they just thought it was for attention. As you've heard, it's has really affected him. It's affected his life. This is part one of me talking with this gentleman. We're going to follow up with part two uh, the next episode. But there was a lot to talk about and get off his chest that he really wanted to for such a long time. And in part two, he's going to discuss how it's affected him with his siblings. I think you'll find it very interesting. He had a lot of questions for me. I don't know if, if I helped solve a lot of those, but uh, in talking about it, I know it helped him. And we've communicated several times afterwards. I thought it was very intriguing, too, that his uncle and his father instantly believed him because they're used to his characteristic, his personality. And so they were used to that, and they instantly knew something was up. So I found that very uh, credible and believable how they responded and that they went out immediately, yet they didn't find anything. It doesn't surprise me. These creatures are so stealth and sleuth and evasive. Don't know what he would have done had he caught this gentleman. I don't know. But anyway, I, I wanted to follow up. I thought this was very intriguing, uh, this encounter. It was uh, very terrifying for him to the point where 40 plus years later, it's still in the back of his mind. It may not be on the forefront, but it, it's always going to be there. And a lot of these people, it's affected at a deep, profound, emotional level to the point where some people have post-traumatic stress um, disorders from this type of event. So if you have experienced something like this gentleman, please give us a call, a toll-free, anytime, or you could contact us, email at cryptidbrothersinvestigations.com at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. We want to know what happened. And more than important, more importantly, we just want you to know you're free to share with us without judgment. 
we really want to reach out to you. So thank you for listening. Stay tuned to part two, and we look forward in hearing from you in the future. Take care, everyone. Bye.